Okay. So the journey begins actually before the First World War, the archaeological journey, let's say, not King Tut himself, where Lord Carnarvon, this English aristocrat here, he hired an up and coming archaeologist called Howard Carter, this man here on the right, who was a very diligent archaeologist. He was a kind of a new breed who really liked to do things well and concise and to take his time to really preserve and record all of the findings. And they were working in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. I'll show you a little map in a sec. But the First World War was rather disruptive for the globe. <laughs> and so all of the work got closed down. And in the after the First World War, in the early 1920s, the work resumed, but it wasn't easy by any means. Howard Carter and his team had found in the area around where King Tutankhamun's tomb was, they found various inscriptions mentioning this pharaoh, Tutankhamun, and they didn't know really where his tomb was. And that incentivized this digging. And in 19, the end of 1921, um, Lord Carnarvon said, look, I haven't really got any money left, so I'm going to have to cancel this. And Howard Carter said, no, just give me one more season. Give me 1922 and I promise you I'll find something. And that is the beginning of our little story there, 1922. So this is where they were digging in the Valley of the Kings. This is it today, obviously, with lots of tourists and all of these tombs that have been um, discovered and opened up of multiple pharaohs from ancient Egypt. This is its rough um, geography in modern day Egypt. So what happened was that they were digging around a pile of rubble near to one of the pharaohs, uh, a much more famous pharaoh, Ramses II. And it turned out that a lot of craftsman buildings had been built on top of King Tut's tomb because it wasn't deemed very important. He was about, I think he was 19 when he died. He was very young and he was rather insignificant in the lineage of pharaohs. And it's funny that nowadays he's the most famous of the pharaohs. And a water carrier who was a young Egyptian man, here he is as a young boy at the time, and he was carrying water to the workers and these water jugs had a rounded bottom. So you had to dig out part of the sand and then plop the jar down in it. And when he was digging out one of these little bits of the sand, he discovered something rather interesting, which I'll get to in the next slide. So this is him when he was young. And then this is, uh, I think this is his son showing the picture of him. And then this is his son showing the picture of him showing the picture of his son. So there is a still existing lineage of people who actually discovered King Tutankhamun's tomb, which I find really a lovely, lovely little touch. What he discovered was just a step. This is what he uncovered, steps leading down into the sands. And this was very exciting. And Howard Carter and his team jumped on it. Huge excavation works took place and they continued going down and down and down and down and ended up in what they assumed to be a royal tomb. Sure enough, these are the steps leading down from the 1920s into this tomb. I've got a quote here from Howard Carter's diary, just to give you a sense of the surprise and wonder that he and his team felt. It was some time before one could see. The hot air escaping caused the candle to flicker. But as soon as one's eyes became accustomed to the glimmer of light, the interior of the chamber gradually loomed before one, with its strange and wonderful medley of extraordinary and beautiful objects heaped upon one another. Lord Carnarvon said to me, Can you see anything? I replied to him, Yes, it is wonderful. We looked in. Our sensations and astonishment are difficult to describe as the light revealed to us the marvellous collection of treasures Two strange ebony black effigies of a king, gold sandaled, bearing staff and mace, loomed out of the cloak of darkness. Gilded couches in strange forms, lion headed and beast infernal, exquisitely painted, inlaid and ornamental caskets, a gold inlaid throne. Beneath our very eyes on the threshold, a lovely lotiform wishing cup in translucent alabaster. 
stools of all shapes and design of both common and rare materials. And lastly, a confusion of overturned parts of chariots glinting with gold. Our sensations were bewildering and full of strange emotion. We questioned one another as to the meaning of it all. Was it a tomb or merely a cache? A sealed doorway between the two sentinel statues proved there was more beyond. And with the numerous cartouches bearing the name of Tutankhamun on most of the objects before us, there was little doubt that there behind was the grave of that pharaoh. We'll come back to these images in a sec that I just showed in brief here. This is an outline of the tomb. It's very small compared to tombs of the other pharaohs. And what happened was that when you became crowned as a pharaoh, usually around the age of 18, they would start building your tomb because you might suddenly die. So you had to have a tomb ready. And there's a lot of speculation that actually this small tomb wasn't actually built for Tutankhamun, it was built for someone else. But he died so quickly after being crowned, a couple of years after being crowned pharaoh, that they actually used someone else's tomb. It's not really sure if that's the case. But if you look at the tomb of Ramses II or Ramses III, I mean, they're enormous, they're huge, because Ramses II, for example, ruled for 60 odd years. So they were building his tomb for kind of 60 years. So there's this antechamber here as you enter into the tomb through the corridor, which is full of all kinds of grave goods. There's the burial chamber itself, like a Russian doll complex, which was originally surrounded by loads of different layers. And then here is the treasury, where there are various valuable religious, spiritual, monetary goods held, including the, the inner organs of uh, the Pharaoh Tutankhamun. There's also an annex here, which was a collection of other household objects. One basic thing which I'll get to in more detail is that the afterlife for the ancient Egyptians, it wasn't the end, so you didn't just become worm food, but it also wasn't that you leave the material world and you go and float on the clouds with angels. You lived as you did, except there wasn't any suffering. You still had your household, you still had a loving wife, you still had kids, you could still go hunting, you could still have a cook cook for you, a carpenter make you a new pair of clogs. Whatever it was, life went on in the afterlife. It's just that there was no suffering anymore. That explains this vast cache of all of these goods from tables and beds and board games and everything that a spiritual slash material pharaoh would need in the afterlife. So these images that I was showing you earlier, these are colorized images taken in 1922 when the tomb was opened. So they're really incredible images. This is how the tomb was discovered. It's rather odd that there's this haphazard array of tombs, but it seems likely that because of the time limit that they had when he was buried, that they didn't have enough time to build a huge tomb. So they had to pile in these objects and break them apart into this smaller space. I'll get onto the timeline and stuff, you know, when he was buried, when he was living in, in a sec. And more images here. So the actual tomb of Tutankhamun is behind this wall here. Uh, but this is an image from before it was even broken into, when they were still speculating. What is this? Is this a treasure trove or is this some kind of royal burial place? And then they did break through with these two potentially guardian statues, which we'll get to later, guarding the entrance to the actual tomb itself. I'll get into all of this in more detail, but just to give you an overview. So this is the tomb room, which is actually very small. And there's this enormous collection of almost Ikea workmanship, where all of these wooden layers inside this tomb, they would have been pieced together inside the tomb, brought in in panels, and then pieced together, and then the walls would have been painted afterwards. One lovely touch I like is this linen shroud with these stars on top of it, which unfortunately hasn't survived, but it's lovely to be able to see this. Um, he was buried in about 1300 BC, so 3,300 years ago. It's just so incredible that they discovered this tomb completely uh, untouched. 
And then from the burial chamber, it leads into the treasure, the treasury, where there's this wonderful statue of Anubis, who's the guide to the underworld, and then the canopic shrine, which is where Tutankhamun's organs were held inside this beautiful golden shrine, which again, I'll get to in more detail later. This is after the Anubis statue was removed, but you can see this, the glint of gold everywhere, which is something that Howard Carter mentioned in his diaries, everywhere, the glint of gold. So the actual tomb itself of Tutankhamun had this clasp across the handles and imprinted in the clay was a curse, which said, whoever opens this shall be cursed. There's no real evidence of any curse. It makes for a great story, but very few of the original founders of the tomb died within, you know, days. <laughs> Most of the people who were there had quite largely long lives. So there's no real evidence for a curse or a disease that crept out. But look into it for yourself if you want to. I'm not going to go into it. But it's amazing that this clasp was still there from three and a half thousand years ago. And Howard Carter broke this clasp and opened the sarcophagus and looked inside. I really find this an incredible picture because, you know, it's not recreated, it's not photoshopped. This is just the exact moment of this discovery. It's really incredible. Before we get into the, the details of the burial and sarcophagus, they found this bust of Tutankhamun, which is probably some kind of um, like a, mum, a, a mannequin so that you could dress him um, to know his form. But it seems that this face is a fairly perhaps close-ish resemblance of the actual Pharaoh himself. Again, three and a half thousand years ago, this young boy's face looking out at you from the depths of history. Okay, a brief timeline. Don't be confused by all of these things. I'm just focusing on this bit here. So this is the new kingdom. And it's roughly around 1500 to 1000 BC. And um, King Tutankhamun, or Pharaoh Tutankhamun, lived around 1300 BC. And he was the last of the 18th dynasty. I'll touch on that a bit later as well. And you can see this name, Achen Aten, above Tut, which I will get to now. So his father was Pharaoh Achenaten, who was a very strange character as far as we can tell, because he completely discarded the old pantheon, the old enormous variety of Egyptian gods. And he just focused on the Aten, the sun god. This was the all seeing, all life giving power, the Aten. And actually Tutankhamun's name when he was born was Tutank Aten. It got changed to Tutank Amun after he became a pharaoh. Tutank, something it could mean in the image of, so in the image of Aten, or when he became later Amun, in the image of Amun, which was a more established Egyptian deity than just the Aten. This very strange style developed around Aachen Aten with these elongated faces. They had very big heads, sort of big stomachs. It was a very weird style. And he actually moved the capital away from Thebes, which is where the Valley of the Kings is, to a place called Armana. It's a very fascinating um, area of history if you want to look into it, the Armana period. Another statue of him here with these sort of luscious cheekbones and lips. He was married initially to Nefertiti, the famous Nefertiti, this beautiful, uh, beautiful female queen, this famous bust of hers. His second wife was then the mother of Tutankhamun. Here is a stone stele from Amarna showing Achenaten here and his wife Nefertiti with these large heads and their stomachs coming out and these weird alien-like bodies worshipping the sun, just the sun, not all of the other Egyptian gods. So it was a real change up. When Tutankhamun came to power at a very young age, he then, with his advisors, I imagine, 
reversed this whole thing and brought it back into the pantheon, these many Egyptian gods, into the established old order. And it never really reverted back to monotheism before uh, Christianity and Islam. So this is a rough diagram of the inner sanctum of the tomb. This is the actual burial chamber. It's the only painted chamber. You can see the paintings on the outside, which I'll get to later. So yeah, they set up this whole layer. You have one, two, three, four different outer layers. Then you have the sarcophagus made of quartzite. And then you have inside that, you have three different coffins. So this whole thing is nested. There's this enormous kind of nest of sacred imagery, sacred rites, meanings, symbolisms, protection of the body. So this was a core Egyptian belief that the body cannot be ruined. So you don't burn the body. The body is essential. The body carries the soul into the afterlife. So that's why the bodies are mummified, because it preserves the body so that it can last and go on into the afterlife. The different organs, for example, they don't do well with embalming. So that's why the organs were removed and they were put in separate jars, which is the next room, the, the canopic shrine. Here's this image again of the burial chamber. So something about the wall paintings before we look at the burial space, which today when you go in there, it just has this this uh, stone sarcophagus with the inner, the inner sarcophagus inside. But these wall paintings, so these were done after the tomb was constructed, after the sarcophagus was constructed. And a bit about the symbolism, just so that you know a bit what's going on. So one of the core themes was the leaving of the soul to the afterlife in a boat. So you get images of boats often in Egyptian, myth, not mythology, sorry, um, death rites. And there's this scarab beetle here. So scarab beetles were a very important symbol in Egyptian mythology and, and religion. They were images of eternity and reincarnation. Scarab beetles, they're the earliest things that people would have seen scuttling around outside. Um, they, they, they arise very early. So the Egyptians associated them with Aten, with the power of the sun, or Ra, who was another, another solar deity. And so they seem to be getting food from this solar power. And they lay their eggs in dead bodies. They lay their eggs in feces. And out of this comes their children. And so they were seen as these immortal beings or a symbol for immortality. So it's quite interesting that a beetle, a lowly insect, gets this pride of place. And then there are 12 monkeys here. So this is a royal rite. This was reserved only for the highest class of the Egyptian aristocracy, where the better knowledge you have about the Book of the Dead, which was a kind of Google Maps about how to navigate in the afterlife, um, was to, for the pharaohs, there was this very important rite, which was about navigating in the afterlife and to go through the 12 hours of the night, which is represented by these 12 monkeys. And each of them has their name. And in order to get through all of these labors, if you like, or these tests, you had to pronounce the names correctly. So they're all written on the inside of the tomb. It's not clear if the everyday Egyptian had access to this afterlife. Um, it's really not sure, but certainly in the, the grand tombs that we have, there's an enormous um, array of ways in which people try to assure their place in eternity through making sure they get the correct rights in place. And on the other side of the wall, you have various images of King Tutankhamun. Here on the right, he's being, he's going through the ceremony of the opening of the mouth with his successor, a guy called Ai, who became Pharaoh after him. And he's got this special instrument which was put into the pharaoh's mouth after they die to allow them to speak, to communicate, and also to eat and to drink in the afterlife. So again, the importance of the, the physical body in the afterlife. And over here, you have Tutankhamun. This is his cartouche with the scarab and this um, ball above it. You can see it here and here. 
being escorted with by his car, which is the, the essence of his soul. And he's embracing Osiris. And you can still see that Osiris has a green face. So Osiris is colored green. He was a god of both fertility, perhaps that's why he's green, but also he was the god of the underworld. In ancient Egyptian mythology, he was killed by his brother and his wife Isis. She had magical powers and she collected the different parts of his body from around the world, brought them together and gave him life again. But he could only have life in the underworld. This is part of the mythology behind mummification as well, in the same way that Isis brought Osiris back together and gave him life, that the mummy is wrapped up in this way and will then have life in the afterlife too. So Osiris is a very important uh, death god, if you like, in the Egyptian world. One quick thing, there's often with the Hollywood films, there's this association with something quite dark and foreboding about the afterlife in ancient Egyptian worlds, that it's somehow menacing. You know, you get this god headed, sorry, dog headed god in the mummy films that wants to kill you and the scarab beetles will eat you. But actually, a lot of the evidence shows that, that it's actually very benign. As long as you're not a bad person, as long as you do the right things, you know, it's, it's kind of very Christian or very essentially religious in its teachings. Be a good person and you will have a lovely eternal life afterwards. There's no real, unless you're a bad person or do things wrong, you get punished. But apart from that, it's actually, it actually seems to be a very benign, beautiful afterlife. One of the best. You just go on with the life that you have and that you love. And uh, you just keep going forever and ever and ever, <laughs> which might seem to some people actually kind of <laughs> kind of bad if you don't like your life situation. But anyway, that's another another topic. <laughs> so this is the, the kind of Russian doll complex of these uh, sarcophagus structures. You've got one, two, three, four different layers of wood with gold plating on the outside leading down into this sarcophagus, all piled in to one another. So this is the outermost tomb, and it's got, not tomb, sorry, layer of the, the burial chamber. And it's got these two symbols here, these two ankh symbols, this symbol of life, and these pillars. So these are symbols of Isis and Osiris. So these two very important underworld deities, which give life to the dead. And you'll see these, the pillars and also this unk, you'll see these um, quite often in e Egyptian, the afterlife symbology. And this lovely blue material is faience, which is a kind of polished ceramic, but it gives a very lovely feel of this, this depth or a kind of otherworldly feel. And gold was very important. The Egyptians thought that gold was the skin of the gods. This was the very flesh of the gods. We'll see later little finger and toe caps, which Tutankhamun has on, which relate to this, the skin of the gods. A lot of the hieroglyphics, they, they mention various texts from the Book of the Dead, which is this guide how to get to eternal life after you die. But there are also references to King Tutankhamun's life and also to his wife just to give you a sense of its, of its scale compared to humans. And these are the inner chambers. And again, many of these, they're all wood with gold leaf on the outside, and they've all been assembled, brought in in panels and then assembled. And they show different things. So the innermost one down here shows the procession, the funeral procession of King Tutankhamun, and others talk about the Book of the Dead and the various rites that the soul has to go through in order to achieve eternal life. I will talk about one of those rites a bit later just to give you a bit of a context. And here are more images of these amazingly sort of burnished gold tombs which kept their luster. You know, when Howard Carter opened many of these areas, they still had this untarnished glint of gold. So this is the innermost sarcophagus uh, quartzite uh, stone, 
you can see on the outside there are these goddesses so there are four winged goddesses with their protective wings on each corner so these were very important after death goddesses that would protect your soul um, among them uh, Selket and Nephthys. Um, yeah I can't actually remember all of their names but I will touch on a couple of them later but you'll see these images very frequently throughout this tour winged goddesses on the corners of these ornaments again you can see down here the pillar and the ankh of Isis and Osiris and this is a 3D cross-section of the innermost burial. So you have one, two, three coffins. Again, the, the third and the second, they're wood with gold leaf. And the last coffin down here is actually solid gold, 110 kilograms of solid gold sarcophagus, which is pretty incredible. This image that you'll see very often in Egyptian mythology and in, in Egyptian iconography, which this is on the outside of the, the tomb, is the crook, oh, sorry, oops, is the crook and the flail. So this is a very ancient symbol of Egyptian pharaohship, of the leader. One theory is that the crook was about leading the sheep, which are your people, being the good shepherd, and the flail being the tough shepherd so you get this mixture of the good and the tough someone who can really keep you in check in a kind of harmonious way so that's one of the most commonly assumed theories about its its significance here are the three to uh, the three sarcophagi on on display just to give you a sense of how they're all packed in inside one another inside this central sarcophagus another image here so this one here is solid gold. <laughs> the whole tomb structure of the sarcophagus, so the stone with these three inside, is about 1.3 tons. So that's an enormous weight, considering that the body after death is not that heavy at all. So this is the outermost coffin. And again, you can see these wings coming down on the side and over here. So these are the winged goddesses. This is Isis and her sister uh, Nephthys, who are these two um, goddesses related to Osiris, who are protecting the deceased with their healing and restorative powers in the afterlife. This is kind of uh, <laughs> just an amazing thing that, that was found inside the, the, the sarcophagi of Tutankhamun was garlands of flowers you can see these garlands inside the sarcophagi when they took off the different layers and Howard Carter in his diary wrote that they speculated that this was the last offering from his wife laying these flowers around his neck and that they were still there when the tomb was opened a uh, hundred years ago so this is the second innermost coffin which is more ornate it's gold plate with layers of lapis lazuli, a very precious stone, and again the winged protections of Osiris and her sister Nephthys, the crook and the flail. And on the headdress, which actually was on the first headdress as well, which is a very common image that we'll see again on this talk, is the cobra here and the vulture. So these were two symbols of two different parts of Egypt lower and upper Egypt and they were actually unified a few thousand years before King Tutankhamun was ruling and so this headdress and the iconography of pharaohs after this time was the two different regions symbolized by this cobra and this vulture's head these two different regions united in one so this is the symbolism behind those two animal forms on the headdress but it's so ornate. I mean, it's so beautiful. It, it's hard to just use pictures to kind of bring out this, uh, how, how lovely these, these ornaments are and how big they are. So this is Howard Carter and an assistant removing the second sarcophagus and getting into the inner layer with this solid gold chunk. It's pretty, pretty incredible. The inner 
sarcophagus here, within which is King Tutankhamun's body. Solid gold, 110 kilograms. Pretty amazing. <laughs> Full of this iconography, again, of the protective winged deities of Isis, the crook and the flail, and this unified kingdom of Lower and Upper Egypt with these two symbols up here. Another view of it here. Just a better view of these two goddesses protecting the deceased pharaoh's body and soul. So this is a black and white photo from when the actual innermost tomb was, sarcophagus was removed. So this is inside the solid gold inner sarcophagus. You get even one more rough layer, which is the funerary mask itself. This is one of the most famous objects in the history of, of archaeology is the funerary mask of Tutankhamun. Gold with inlays of lapis lazuli, various glasses and other precious stones, and the snake and the, the vulture's head here, representing this two different parts of Egypt united in one. The eye makeup, by the way, Part of it was it was a protection against sun, they think, that it deflected the sun's rays, which allowed, the, allowed you to see better in this glaring sunlight, which is just one little sort of fact I would throw in there, which is quite, quite interesting. Another view of it here. So this image is of power and of confidence. It's gold. This is the flesh of the gods. This is a headdress called a ket, which is only reserved for the pharaohs to wear, and on its headdress are united the two different regions of Egypt into one under this one power of the ruler. Another view of it, just to give you a sense of its, of its size. So this is actually a recreation of the body. I will show you the, the mummy itself in a sec, but just to give you a sense of how it was found with these decorations on it. So the Egyptian afterlife in religion, there was loads of magic in it. There were amulets and potions and spells and all kinds of superstitions, which would give you a better road into the afterlife. And so Tutankhamun was covered in these amulets and I'm going to show you some of these in more detail because they're really quite special. So this one has the scarab carrying the sun. So this is the scarab in the image of the god Ra. But it's this image of eternity, of immortality, of never-ending life, which is the key tenet of the Egyptian afterlife. This is an image of the falcon, so the god Horus, who was one eye was the sun and one eye was the moon. You can see the sun and the moon here and that his power was uniting the sky and the heavens. In other ancient religions, such as the Native American religions, you know, falcons and birds of prey high up in the sky were seen as beings that were between the land and they were between the sky. They were semi-divine beings and it seems there was something similar in ancient Egypt this amazing falcon image. And this one is very fascinating. This shows again the barge of life and the sun and the moon and Ra, the god who is god of the sun, carrying the sun and the moon in this barge across the sky. But it's got this strange yellowy color and they did research at the time in the 1930s and thought it was just a kind of gemstone. And then it came out that it was a substance called desert glass. But no one knows still today really where desert glass comes from. One theory is that it's from a meteor strike. Only, it seems, an actual meteor smashing into the desert in North Africa would have allowed that kind of heat to create these segments of, you know, liquefied sand. There's not really another theory that suggests how this stone came to be in the deserts of Libya and northern Africa. So it could be that it's from a meteorite. So this gemstone right in the center of this powerful amulet came from outer space, which I find really a lovely thought to entertain. 
So here is um, Zawi Hawass, who's the head of Egyptian uh, archaeology antiquities with the actual mummy of Tutankhamun. They did various scans of his body and the current theory is that he died at the age of about 19 or 20 from a gangrenous wound to his leg. He anyway had a lame leg. So one theory is that he was out hunting in a chariot and fell off and fractured or broke one of his legs, which then became gangrenous and he died from that gangrene. It's still a kind of ongoing theory, but it's quite interesting to know. Here is his face. They did some lovely computer generations to show how he would have looked with a very low chin and protruding upper jaw. But I find it quite amazing to look on this face from three and a half thousand years ago, which is a fairly good representation of what he may have looked like. I find it kind of quite uh, spine tingling. Inside the tomb, inside the, the inner sarcophagus, sorry, were these golden sandals with these toe caps. As I was saying earlier, gold was the color of the God's flesh, the God's skin. And so the, the bits of him that were outside of the, the mummification wrappings were then covered with these golden tips. There, there may have also been some deeper um, sort of religious significance. He also had these on his fingers. So moving on from this inner tomb into the treasury. Another quote from uh, Howard Carter here about him seeing this for the first time. And I again find it really lovely to revisit these through the actual words of the discoverers themselves. Facing the doorway on the further side stood the most beautiful monument that I've ever seen so lovely that it made one gasp with wonder and admiration. The central portion of it consisted of a large shrine-shaped chest, completely overlaid with gold and surmounted by a cornice of sacred cobras. Surrounding this freestanding were statues of the four tutelary goddesses of the dead, gracious figures with outstretched protective arms, so natural and lifelike in their pose so pitiful and compassionate the expression on their faces that one felt it almost sacrilege to look at them. So what he's talking about is the canopic shrine here with these cobras on the top and these four goddesses surrounding each side, which I'll talk about more in a sec. So this is when it was first discovered, the statue of Anubis here wrapped in a shroud. So it's wood, but there are various things laid out in gold and also in silver. For me, it's a very touching part of the tomb. I find it really lovely. Again, Anubis wasn't a dark sort of meany, foreboding god of the afterlife that's going to kill you. He was a psychopomp, which is a guide into the afterlife. Uh, Dante had it with Virgil, for example, where Virgil was his guide into, into hell. And Anubis was the ancient Egyptian guide into the afterlife. He would take the hand of your soul and lead you into the afterlife. And I find it so lovely that the statue is still there, or was still there, <laughs> guarding the, the most sacred part of King Tutankhamun's afterlife, which was his inner organs. Without those, his body could not go on. It's a really beautiful statue here with this gold ears, uh, gold necklace, if you like, and these silver, silver claws staring out with this kind of canine calmness out into the, the abyss of, of time. So this is Anubis. This is just from a, a, a papyrus from ancient Egypt, guiding the soul of the dead to the afterlife. And what would happen is that you would pass through various different tests. So this is where the Book of the Dead came in, how to get through those tests. And then you would get to the weighing of the heart. This is the heart in the left side of the balance and a feather here. And the test was your heart, so the goodness of your being, 
would be balanced against a feather. And if the heart were heavier than the feather, then you would be eaten. Your soul would be eaten by this monster here. All of the worst things that Egyptians could imagine, a crocodile, a lion, and a hippo, all in one animal. Your soul being eaten was the worst thing imaginable because that would be the end. That would be darkness. This is, of course, a very good drive to be good in your daily life and is potentially one of the things that cemented the, the Egyptian power for so many thousands of years was potentially this sense of being good in this life <laughs> um, because otherwise you would have no afterlife. So th this belief in the afterlife was incredibly, incredibly strong. After you would go through this test, if your heart was pure, you would go to the field of reeds, which was this paradise. And it's interesting to see some of these old temple designs like at Karnak, just across the Nile River from the Valley of the Kings, where you get these enormous columns with reed patterns coming out the top. If you look at a recreation of how it may have looked, you get a sense of these temples being physical incarnations of this afterlife, the field of reeds. Another image of Anubis staring out at you. So this is a recreation of the Canopic Shrine, just to give you a sense of it in its grandeur. But still today, it's still pretty spectacular. Some of the gold has flaked off. So on the top are these cobras with the sun disk above them. So part of this connection between Lower and Upper Egypt that I was talking about with the cobra and the vulture was that they were actually kind of cult religions worshipped in these two areas that became very prominent. And the, the Lower Egypt was the cobra with the sun disk above its head. And this then became a symbol for kingship, for divine authority. So the pharaohs, just like many kings in across kings and queens across the world for thousands of years, believed that their power was coming directly from the gods or the god, and that they were the one who answered that call, no one else. This was the same with the pharaohs. So this symbol, the cobra with the sun disk, is this symbol of divine power and divine kingly authority. And these four goddesses on each side, and as Howard Carter said, so carefully looking after the shrine, you could barely look at it. And this is Selket here, one of the protective uh, goddesses who has a scorpion on her head. Another view of it here, detached from the, from the shrine. And then opening the shrine, um, you come to the canopic jars, which I'll get to in a sec. But on the outside of the shrine, all of these images are various different moments from Tutankhamun's life and also writings from the Book of the Dead, this guide to the afterlife. So one such image is Tutankhamun. Again, you can see his scarab and the sun disk here, his cartouche with his wife. Um, his wife is delicately rubbing special religious ointments into his skin. So it's an image of a king in all of his power with a devoted, loving wife. So inside the Canopic Shrine is this set of Canopic jars. They're carved out of a single block of alabaster. The whole thing is just carved out of one block. These weren't added in later. It's all carved out of one thing, which is really quite amazing. And again, you can see these goddesses who are embracing the different corners. It's again, these four goddesses protecting the, uh, the soul of the deceased. This, uh, these hieroglyphs actually say that these four goddesses, they are protecting the gods who are protecting the organs inside these canopic jars. So it's a little, little layered there. I find these so lovely, these very delicate, almost sort of luminous stones, uh, three and a half thousand years old, it's so incredible. So when you lift up these heads inside, you get the canopic jars themselves. 
the canopic jars are four different gods. They are the sons of Horus, who is connected with the afterlife, and they each have a different organ to look after, whether it's the lungs, the intestines, the stomach. They're very carefully looking after these organs. So King Tut's organs were actually put inside these jars. Even these, I mean, they're only a few sort of six to ten inches high, but they are gorgeous. They're so carefully inlaid with these beautiful gems and, and gold. I mean, the whole thing is so, so lavish. It's really beautiful. Also found in the treasury were two tiny little sarcophagi, two tiny little mummies, because King Tutankhamun, uh, very young, and his wife, very young, had two children, but they were stillborn and they were mummified and buried inside King Tutankhamun's tomb with him. His two children, his lineage, and actually he's the last leader of the 18th dynasty. Uh, such an amazing object also found in the treasury is this alabaster, again, this lovely stone, alabaster jar which is symbolizing again the unification of Lower and Upper Egypt with these two, um, two different sides here. But it's such a beautiful ornament, um, probably used for something like perfume. So then we move into this area, so the antechamber, where there's just a huge collection of different goods. And this is where this is, will be the last, uh, the last section of the, of the talk. So again, these early colored photos from the 1920s showing this jumble of images. So I want to start with um, something that Howard Carter found. The first thing that he found going into King Tut's tomb was this alabaster cup on the floor, right in the entranceway. And it's really amazing that this is the first thing that he found because it's not really that special. It's a drinking cup, a kind of ritual drinking cup showing Tutankhamun arising out of the marshes like a lotus flower. But this inscription on the top is an inscription that Howard Carter put on his grave when he died. And it reads, may your spirit live. May you spend millions of years, you who love Thebes sitting with your face to the north wind, your eyes beholding happiness. And you can read this on Howard Carter's tomb. I just find it such a lovely link that it's the very first thing that he found. All of the rest of the gold and the fancy stones and the grandeur. And what touched him most was this little alabaster cup. And these two statues either side of the entranceway into the sarcophagus in the antechamber, they're really quite spectacular statues. They're, they're life-size, sort of six foot tall, gold on wood. And people have often called them guardians, so they're guarding the tomb of Tutankhamun. They're even called that in most of the exhibitions you go to. But it's not really sure. They may just have been different aspects of the afterlife for King Tutankhamun. So there are many things in the tomb which talk about how he's going to live his life in the afterlife and support him in that. So these statues may just be different powers to give to this soul of the Pharaoh. They may not simply be guardians, but because they're standing either side of the entranceway, it's quite easy to call them guardians. So yeah, they're really quite, uh, quite beautiful statues. Again, I mean, three and a half thousand years old. It's just so, so incredible. There's also quite a rare image of an animated character who's stepping forwards on this barge. So this is Tutankhamun and he is going hunting. He's going hunting in the marshes because he's on a boat but it's very rare that you get something this animated in Egyptian funerary art, which is really quite, quite, quite lovely. It's a very graceful figure. I love how this sandal is bent with his foot like this. It's wood with, with a gold, gold leaf. It's really lovely. And just to show again the unification of Lower and Upper Egypt, 
they had two different crowns for Lower and Upper Egypt. And in a lot of iconography, you see them joined into one crown, which represents this unification of these two different areas of Egypt. And then one of the most ornate chests which were found, there were many chests found, you can see all these different chests here, is this one down here. And it shows a hunting scene, King Tut hunting in a chariot down here. So as a lame young man, it doesn't seem that he would have had very much time at all. Sorry, not hunting, this is going into battle um, <laughs> with, with men. It seems highly unlikely that King, T King Tut would have actually gone into battle being lame and being that young. So this is probably a very fanciful <laughs> chest, but it's just so beautifully wrought and beautifully designed. Um, really, really amazing. Considering that in the Greek world, for example, as far as we know, images like this start to arrive in the, the 600s and 500s BC on, on pottery, you know, to have this a thousand years earlier is really, really incredible. So also found in this area was the throne, the golden throne of Tutankhamun, which it seems would have been used for certain religious practices, special religious practices or holding court. And it's wood with uh, quite a thick layer of gold in places. It's really an incredible chair. It's, it's still burnishing and bright gold to this day, three and a half thousand years later. So it's got the lions on the armrests and the lion's feet all around this, the most ferocious of the animals, the symbol of power. And in the background, is King Tut with his wife. As we saw earlier on the Canopic Shrine, she is embalming him with a special religious uh, ointment. And he's sitting there again, sort of looking pretty chilled <laughs> with his wife. So it's this image of devotion and harmony in the ruling world. And above you can see the one sun. So people think that this throne was actually built very early on in King Tut's life when Akhenaten was still alive, his father, who was still encouraging this worship of this one God with the sun. So this is actually quite a useful piece of, of archaeological evidence for the Armona period. Just a, a better quality view there, all you know, inlaid with this gold and these precious stones and glass. It's really, really lovely. And on the back, the power of the pharaoh, the cobra, with these sun disks above the head. And there were all kinds of other aspects of furniture too, but also war chariot. There's this very sort of spindly looking war chariot which was very fanciful at the time of Tutankhamun. It seems it was quite new around that time, around three and a half thousand years ago. It revolutionized battle. You could have an archer standing on the back, as you can see here, with a much larger supply of arrows that they could have if they were on horseback, also much more accuracy. Um, and uh, yeah, so this was the, the Bugatti sports car of the ancient world or the, the private jet it was an incredibly valuable piece and it's been reassembled in the museum shows. And the bits of furniture like a bed, again this was disassembled when it was put in the tomb, as you can see here, these lion figures, but reassembled it would have been a kind of bed, which is the thing I like about a lot of these things is that they would still be cool today. You could still, if you had these in your house, people would be like, whoa, what is this? You know, that's so cool. It's really, really amazing. Another kind of bed with these, these bulls. Really, really awesome. And he was not to be bored in his afterlife. So he was buried with board games, perhaps fitting for a young man. He was buried with different kinds of games that are potentially similar to a kind of chess, a kind of play between two different sides mimicking a kind of battle. And the last ornament we'll be looking at are the shabtis. So shabti can mean something like a server or someone that you call upon. 
So originally in the ancient Egyptian world, in the old older kingdoms, the Shaptis were one image that was put into the tomb, which would be the, the reanimating force of the body. It would be like a, a kind of hologram of the body, if you like, that would take on the body and become new. But as the ages progressed, and by the time of Tutankhamun, the high level tombs were filled with these Shaptis and they were servants. There were servants for everything. So in the afterlife, if you wanted to go and farm, if you wanted to go hunting, if you wanted to cook, you could. But if you didn't want to, and you had the money to have these Shaptis put into your tomb, you had a cook, you had a baker, you had a gardener, you had a farmer, you had a, a masseuse or <laughs> whatever the modern equivalent would be. And so he was buried with hundreds of these Shaptis to fulfill all kinds of needs, every single need that this pharaoh would need in the afterlife. So he's buried in this quite a small space with a whole household of staff. This is just a close up of one of these Shaptis, again, very delicately crafted. So I wanted to end with the finder of King Tut's tomb, which was this young boy. And he got the honor of wearing a necklace that was on King Tut's in his uh, burial chamber, which is this amazing necklace, if you like, I guess, with these scarab beetles on it, symbols of eternity and immortality. There is the face of King Tutankhamun gazing out at you from three and a half thousand years ago. So that's the end of the talk. I really hope you enjoyed it and got a good introduction to the treasures and to the tomb of King Tutankhamun. So thank you. <laughs>